All right, welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Libwood, and this is another video for our series of training materials for Theogen's Terra workflows for SARS-CoV-2 genomic analysis. Today's video is a follow-up for understanding outputs for the Titan workflows for genomic characterization. And today's focus will be on the clade and lineage outputs generated by these workflows. All right, so with that, let's get into it. And just as a refresher, the Titan workflows for genomic characterization include four separate workflows that take sequencing data from four different sequencing approaches, both paired in and single end Illumina data, Clear Labs read data, and ONT data. And with the input read data from these platforms, these Titan workflows generate SARS-CoV-2 consensus assemblies, provide metrics to gauge the quality of those assemblies, and provide genomic characterization through Pangolin and Nextclade typing. And so the focus of my last video was on the quality control metrics generated by these workflows. But today, I wanted to provide some background and information on the most relevant output for clade and lineage typing made available through Nextclade and Pangolin, respectively. Okay, so let's start off by taking a closer look at the Nextclade outputs made available by these workflows. So the first output I want to cover is the Nextclade clade. As the name implies, this is the clay designation made by the Nextclade software. So when one of these Titan workflows for genomic characterization is run, the consensus assembly that is generated is analyzed using Nextclade. And Nextclade will perform clay assignment on the basis of signature mutations. So for this output field, you'll see one of these Nextclade clades assigned to your sample, for example, 20F or 19A, depending on the mutations identified in the consensus assembly. In addition to the clade assignments, these Titan workflows for genomic characterization also output the amino acid substitutions and deletions identified by Nextclade. It's important to note here, though, that these are the substitutions and deletions that were explicitly identified in the data provided, which can be a bit tricky if you have an expected variant that isn't listed since the absence of a substitution or deletion in these output fields can be the product of two scenarios. Either that variant isn't present in the sample's actual biological genome, or that variant isn't present in our in silico genome assembly generated from the sequencing experiment, i.e. there wasn't enough high quality read data generated for that specific loci in that sample. And looking at these output values alone won't tell you which of these two scenarios is the reason for a missing deletion or substitution. This is where the Nextclade visualization can be incredibly useful. Now, this visualization isn't generated by the Titan workflows themselves, but let's jump into a Terra workspace really quickly so I can show you how to download an assembly and upload it to Nextclade and inspect the variants using this kind of visualization. Okay, so here we have a Terra workspace, and I filtered the data space to show only the Nextclade outputs that I had mentioned. And each of these samples has been identified as a 501YV1. But let me zoom out a bit and expand this amino acid substitution output. Okay, so if I do a quick control find across these elements and look for that 501Y mutation, you'll notice that a few of these samples are missing that crucial 501Y variant. So the big question here is if this mutation is absent in this field because these samples' genomes don't have this key variant, or is it absent from the list because we don't have enough sequence data at this position and there's a string of ends or missing data in the genome assembly. So to get further insight on this, what we can do is download the assembly from Terra and upload it to Nextclade for a closer inspection at that specific site. So what I'll do is pull up the assembly FASTA file by clicking this gear here and selecting assembly FASTA. Let me zoom in here to make things easier to see and hit done. And we're gonna take this sample 11 here that was missing that 501Y variant in this substitution list. So I'm gonna click this and I'm gonna hit download. And I'll place this on my desktop for quick access here. Okay, now I'll navigate directly to Nextclade and a link to this website will be in the description below. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down and I can drag and drop this file directly and hit run. All right, so here is our sample 11 that was designated as a 501Y, but was missing that key variant in the assembly. 
And if we look at this section here, Nextclade will color code the positions that differ from the reference genome. And if you look at this key, you can see that these dark gray bands represent the regions of missing data in the assembly. And so in this case, I'm looking at that 501Y variant, which is at position 23063. So if we hover over here near that loci, you can see that this genome assembly has missing data or ends at that exact position. So given the presence of all these other defining mutations, it's still very likely that this is a true 501Y, despite this specific amino acid substitution not being present in that Nexclade amino acid substitution list. And because this is a bit of a manual and time-consuming process, I wouldn't recommend doing this for every sample sequenced. But if there are some high-priority samples that you are curious to look at closer, you can always take this approach. And in a case you ever need to assess multiple samples at a time on Nextclade, you'll need to provide a concatenated FASTA file that includes each assembly you care to assess. And we do have a workflow for that called Cat Column Content, and I'll include a link for that in the description below. I'll be sure to walk through how you can use that resource for assessing multiple samples on Nextclade in a future video, and we'll add a link in the description once it is available. For now, let's move on to the Pangolin outputs. Okay, so switching gears, let's talk about the critical outputs from Pangolin. First, let's start with the Pango lineage. This, of course, is the lineage designation made by the Pangolin software. So in this field, you'll see the Pango lineage designation for each sample. And for those wondering why this is a Pango lineage rather than a Pangolin lineage, it's because Pangolin actually stands for Phylogenetic Assignment of Named Global Outbreak Lineages. So to avoid redundant use of the word lineage, the appropriate nomenclature is Pango lineage. And while Nextclade will try to make a clade designation no matter the quality of the input assembly, Pangolin, at least by default, will not make a lineage designation for samples that have assemblies made up of over 50% ends or a genome length of less than 10,000 base pairs. So if the sample has a poor assembly that falls below these metrics, you'll see a none in the Pango lineage output field. Okay, and so next is the Pangolin conflicts and the Pangolin notes. So the Pangolin conflict value is an indicator of ambiguity in lineage designation made within the Pangolin decision tree. So if there is a conflict score of one, that means that this sequence can fit into multiple categories, while a conflict score of zero means that there is only one lineage that this sample can properly fit into. And for samples that fall below the QC metrics I just mentioned and receive a none for Pango lineage, you'll see an NA for the Pangolin conflicts. And last but not least is the Pangolin notes. This will only be populated for samples that fall below the QC metrics I mentioned and for certain VOCs. For samples that don't meet the Pangolin quality standard, you'll see a message here indicating what QC metric was failed. For example, you may see a note here indicating the percentage of ends identified in the consensus assembly. And for certain VOCs, as of May 17, 2021, this includes B117, B1351, P1, P2, and P3, you'll see a message here indicating the number of VOC defining SNPs identified in that sample. So here's an example of what those outputs might look like for a few B117s. And so let's focus here on sample 14. So looking first at the Pango lineage and Pangolin conflicts, we can see that sample 14 has been identified as a B117 with zero conflicts. That is to say that there is no other category that this sample could be placed in by Pangolin other than B117. Okay, and so looking at the Pangolin notes output for this sample, we can see that 14 of the 17 characteristic B117 SNPs were identified. And then we see some additional information here in this parenthetical. And the way to read that is, since 14 of the 17 characteristic B11 SNPs were identified, of the remaining three other characteristic SNPs, none of them match the reference strain, and three of those loci are either a SNP that isn't characteristic of B117, or it is missing data, i.e. an N in the consensus assembly. And it's always worth noting with a tool like Pangolin that this is how to interpret these results for at least the time being. It's likely that these metrics will change. In fact, these metrics are expected to change since the developers of Pangolin have mentioned work towards providing other metrics to gauge the confidence of these lineage calls. 
Which brings me to two other Pangolin outputs that I wanted to highlight, the Pangolin version and the Pangolin docker. Now, these Titan workflows for genomic characterization will output the versions of every software utilized, including Nextclade. But I wanted to highlight the Pangolin version specifically because of how often this resource is updated. And these updates are really a product of the unbelievable efforts of Anya O'Toole and her team in Andrew Rambut's lab at the University of Edinburgh as a part of the Arctic network. Our understanding of SARS-CoV-2 is expanding every day, and as a result, the tools we use to investigate this virus are on a similarly dynamic route of development. And with Pangolin, we've seen updates happen as often as twice in a single day. So to keep track of things, we've written the Titan workflows for genomic characterization to output both the Pangolin version, which includes the Pangolin software version and the Pangolin model, as well as the actual Pangolin Docker used for analysis. And when we make a new version release of the Public Health Viral Genomics Repository, we update the default Pangolin Docker in accordance to the most recent and stable release available on the StatB Docker Hub page. I'll be sure to link this resource below. In a future video, I'll show you how you can update the optional input parameters for these workflows to use different Docker tags available and even highlight a different workflow, the Pangolin Update workflow, that allows you to recall the lineages for samples that were previously analyzed when a new Pangolin version becomes available. But for now, I just want to make sure that you are all aware of where this information can be found after running your analysis. So that's it for now. I hope this was clear for everyone and that you were able to learn a little bit from this video. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below and we will be sure to clarify as much as we can. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one.